call the LPA uh, meeting uh, order. Just please stand for the P Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, if we can any, uh, do a roll call, please, sir. Chairman Maturo. Here. Member Lombardo. Here. Member Lohan. Here. Member Bornstein. Yeah, Bornstein. No. Born. Whatever. <laughs> M Member Doogie. Here. Member Morlock. Mem Member Cola Pietro. This is not working. I think yeah, okay. two, two absences at this time. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there any public comments right now? Okay, with with none, we're going to appoint a vice chair. I make a motion to appoint Steve Lohan as vice chair. All in favor? Or I need someone to second it, please. I'll second it. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Steve Lohan is now the vice chair. Congratulations, Mr. Lohan. We're thank happy, you. I think we're happy you're here. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to review the following land development code amendments for consistency with the City of Bonita Springs comprehensive plan. You're going to take over. Thank you. Good morning for the record, Jacqueline Hansen with Community Development. Included in your packet was a short memorandum summarizing the changes that are before you today. These changes were briefly presented to the City Council where we received direction to go ahead and pursue the amendments. The amendment was scheduled for first reading yesterday and it was a motion to move it to second reading and it is here before you today. So with a very brief presentation, I'm going to go over one aspect of the amendments and then Mr. Fegon will go ahead and finish this up. So the first section deals with the mobile home section of the land development code. And just to give you some history, maybe about 10 years ago, the only way you could go ahead and construct a conventional single family building in a mobile home district was through a special exception approval process. And that's a public hearing application which requires time, money, and things like that. And it didn't make sense to the city to go ahead and require something like that when you're getting a more resilient home. So we went ahead and permitted the use by right. And that is very much in tune with our neighbors to the north in Lee County. Um, but what we also did was we were worried about the mass and scale of these buildings next to tiny mobile homes. Because at that time, to meet the flood regulations, you could elevate the mobile homes on piers. For conventional buildings, you had to elevate them to the first um, finished floor elevation as required by the special flood hazard area maps. Um, so there was a concern about mass and scale from that standpoint. So what we did is we said, well, if you want to go ahead and construct a single family home in a mobile home district, you have to follow the non-conforming section for single family homes, which meant um, and it really affected the street and rear setbacks. So you had to be 20 feet set back from the front in most cases and 20 feet set back in the rear or 25 if you're on water. Whereas mobile homes, they could keep their non-conforming mobile home setbacks, which could be five feet. So what we're finding as part of the Hurricane Ian recovery efforts is that with these substandard mobile home lots, if people want to build back better with more resilient homes, their homes end up being like the size of a postage stamp. It, it really doesn't make sense. So we, we found that a hindrance. And so we are coming back and saying, let's relook at this because now mobile homes have to be elevated to the same standard as a conventional home. So the concerns on mass and scale really aren't there anymore. So that's what that amendment essentially does. Um, so in the packet, you'll go ahead and see the actual strike through an underline of the text. It, it affects our use regulation table because there's notes that then say, go see the non-conforming section. Um, so that's really the scope of the changes. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Do I not see? No questions? Okay. Great, all right. Mr. Fegon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Mike Fegon with Community Development for the Record. I'll go ahead and take you through the, uh, the final couple changes that we're proposing here in the code. Uh, this next section has to do with the downtown form-based code, uh, which was passed back in November of 2020 by City Council after a 
pretty lengthy process to amend that downtown redevelopment area and the codes that are part of that area. Uh, we, we had a sentence in there with regards to how to deal with properties that are in multiple overlay districts. Uh, for an example, when you look at the boundaries of the uh, downtown district, you have a pretty good swath of property that's also along Bonita Beach Road. So you have that Bonita Beach Road, Old 41 kind of quadrant there. Um, and there's this good grouping of properties along that roadway that are in two overlays. They're subject to the standards of the Old 41 downtown district and they're subject to the standards of the Bonita Beach Road Corridor. Two separate standards, two separate ways of developing. Um, so it became a little bit confusing at times in terms of which standard to apply when. Uh, so one of the things that we tried to do initially was to say, well, if you're along Bonita Beach Road, even if you're in multiple corridors, you are developing to the Bonita Beach Road standards, and that's it. And similar to what we're seeing with mobile homes, we're starting to see some of the unintended consequences of doing that, keeping in mind that the gateway to your downtown district, that redevelopment area, is off of Beach Road. So it would probably make some sense to provide some flexibility to give them the option to also develop using the standards of that downtown district, of that old 41 overlay, since that is the gateway to that area. And, and this is what this simple change does. So, you know, removing the word shall, as in you shall develop to the beach road standards and replacing it to may. You may develop under the beach road standards. You now have a little bit more flexibility in design uh, for how you choose to develop in that gateway. Uh, both sets of standards still have, you know, very good design requirements. You're still gonna get the look you want either way. This is more just an exercise in design flexibility uh, with development. And we also have a, a change to the uh, signage section for the downtown area as well. Uh, obviously, we're starting to see things pick up downtown, which has been the goal all along. We're starting to see some new construction, new projects taking shape. So one of the things that we wanted to do was provide additional signage opportunities for those projects that are getting ready to be under construction. You probably see this more in, in some more urbanized areas, which is kind of what we're trying to do downtown anyway. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, having the signs that are along the construction fence that show, you know, perhaps a rendering of the project, you know, coming soon, the name of the architect, that type of thing. We really didn't have a concrete allowance for that type of signage downtown, and it just made sense to go ahead and offer that up as an option, keeping it in mind that it is temporary in nature. You know, these fences and these signs come down once the project is fully constructed, but sort of, you know, given an extra FYI to the, passer, the, the passers-by, um, of what's, what's coming down the pipeline in terms of development. So uh, that, the, that, those are the changes that we are proposing for the downtown area. Do you have any questions regarding those before I move on to the next one? Yes. Uh, the signage can't be higher than the surrounding signs, right? The signage can't be higher than the fence. So if you're gonna put the sign on the fence and you have a construction fence, the sign cannot be higher than the fence. Is there a limitation on the size of the fence? Yes, there is. We, we, we designate the fence height based on proximity to a roadway and also proximity to a corner. Obviously, we want to be very mindful of pedestrian visibility and vehicle visibility. So the more you converge on that corner, the lower the allowable height for the fence, and the signs are going to be the same. Uh, are the signs going to be restricted just to the application of that building site? What's going to happen there as opposed to other signage that may just wind up on the fence as well? Yes, it, it's going to be restricted to project-related signage. So the name of the project, the architect, the construction crew, uh, a rendering of the project. We're not, there is no allowance for what we call um, off-site advertising, where you can advertise a project that might be happening down the road or a business that might be coming next door. No, that business needs to advertise on their property. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is germane by a thread, but um, is there any consideration given to mitigating traffic in that area on 041? Because it's impossible right now with more construction, more buildings, more people. John? <clears throat> right now, the council's looking at prohibiting uh, larger trucks to go through there and different ways to, to limit the size of vehicles that go through downtown. So that should have a direct impact on, on some of the volume numbers. In terms of what you're looking at 
for passenger cars, that's just going to be a market-driven uh, exercise. Once you start to see businesses and restaurants go down there, the whole purpose of people going down there will be to visit those restaurants or businesses. Until those are there, people look at it as a way to get from where they are to where they want to be. So it's just the road to get to somewhere. And you're saying driving habits are going to change once there are these businesses are established and people realize you can't get through those areas. Because we all live here. I don't know if you guys have been down there. Mm -hmm. You can wait in line literally 40 minutes just to go on 041 to get to maybe Terry. That, well, that's what we're hoping on. So if, if things work the way we think, you know, as businesses start to pick up, you'll see the type of traffic down there change. Thank you very much. Mr. Lohan? Well, I was just going to comment, too, about for emergency our, with our fire station there. It's uh, running a ladder truck out of there. Is, it's uh, been causing us some major grief uh, running emergencies, but we've figured out a way to try to get around it, but it still is adding three or four minutes to our response time. Um, I was just going to comment that the example that you show on the screen for the signage on the fence is way better than looking at the fence. I think it's a good improvement for soon. So. Awesome. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Sure. Yep, we'll move on to the next one really quick. The next one has to do with the other overlay we were just talking about, the Bonita Beach Road corridor overlay. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing with the, the, the Beach Road overlay is you have a uh, a large section of allowable uses uh, within the beach road overlay and then you have several uses that require uh, a special exception before they could be activated and a special exception is a type of public hearing process where you sort of present the use in a certain way and you can attach conditions of approval to the use to make sure that it operates within very specific boundaries um, and one of the things that we're sort of uh, that we've been seeing is we have a lot of uses that are, you know, technically would require a special exception, uh, but they don't have any of the detriments that are associated with needing a special exception. So in other words, when we look at a special exception in the beach road overlay, it's really designed and geared towards trying to alleviate uh, auto-centric impacts. You know, if it's an auto-heavy use, uh, it typically requires a special exception, you know, drive-throughs, car washes, things like that. Um, or if it's something that could have essentially impact the exterior of the site uh, or the overall site functionality, you know, it requires a special exception. It's, it's an additional level of review uh, to make sure that these things are going to be happening appropriately. And what we're seeing is we're getting requests for a lot of those uses that are looking to take place completely indoors. Um, so the, the exterior impacts are pretty much mitigated. But the code doesn't differentiate between if you want to do something indoors or if you want to do something in a traditional outdoor way. We'll take a car wash as an example. Typically, when you go to car washes, you're used to, you know, waiting in line. You pay the attendant or you type in your code. You go through the tunnel. Then you pull to the vacuum stations. You know, it's a pretty big operation that, you know, you're sort of in an assembly line, if you will, of cars to kind of go through the process. And one of the examples that we're seeing is, uh, you know, we had a business wanted, that wanted to do a car wash that was going to be 100% interior by appointment only, and they were going to take maybe three appointments a day. So you drop off your car, it goes into the, into the, uh, the, the, the completely enclosed area, they do the washing, the detailing, the waxing, you know, these are the things that, you know, you're going to take your, your baby to, uh, your higher end vehicles usually, um, and then when they're done, they give you a call and you come pick it up. So it's a, it's a completely different type of impact than a traditional car wash that we're used to. And it sort of alleviates a lot of the exterior site concerns that we're worried about with traditional car washes, like a long queuing line and you know, car stacking and you know, messy soap areas and things like that and the exterior look of a car wash when you're driving by. Well, if it's taking place 100% indoors and there's no exterior impact and you're, it's taking place within a building that's designed to your corridor standards, does it really matter, you know, that type of thing? So what we, what we did was we went through and we picked out uses that sort of we could carry that logic through, um, where there really aren't any exterior impacts, no exterior modifications needed to the site. You would never know the use is occurring because it's happening 100% within a building already. Uh, so we, we picked out some uses that we felt would be appropriate to, to handle it that way, as opposed to making them go through a special exception to try and justify that use. Um, now, this does not remove the ability for some of those more traditional, messier uses to have to go through the special exception. So if you still want the traditional car wash, 
you know, those types of things, you're still gonna go through the special exception process. This just gives you additional flexibility if you're in an area where you can, you know, operate 100% within a building. And I keep harping on a car wash because I just did one two days ago, a special exception in front of the zoning board, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, but, you know, there's other uses on there that it would apply to as well. Vehicle and equipment dealers, you know, when you look at uh, car sales and car lots, um, you think of, you know, buildings that take up a ton of space, you have all your inventory parked outside, you know, those types of things. You have big lights for security. Well, what we're also seeing is we have a lot of people that maybe have two or three cars. They want to be able to sell them indoors. They're specialty cars. Perhaps they're higher end, perhaps not. But again, everything is taking place 100% within the building. If that's the case, do they really need to go through the special exception, which is designed really to mitigate exterior impacts? There aren't any. So why put them through that? Um, so that's another example of what we're looking to do. So uh, the uses are clearly marked in your packet, the ones that we're looking to, to update and also allow uh, by right. But again, we're not removing any of the special exception components. If you still want that traditional car lot, if you still want that type of car wash, those things, you still have to go through that special exception process. And that's all we have for you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. that everything from you guys? Boy, that was short and sweet. Uh, we have an update from February 22nd, 2023 LPA meeting. We, we would like a, we would like a, a vote Motion. on recommendations on, on the three proposed changes. Motion Perfect. to find them consistent with the comprehensive plan is typically what we ask for oh. the LPA to do. Okay, we're gonna do just that. I need a motion for consistent of the LPA plan that they just, we'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, and now we're going to do an update. <laughs> right. uh, so at your February meeting, you had a presentation by Dr. Banyan from Florida Gulf Coast University regarding the evaluation and appraisal review um, report that ultimately was presented to the city council in March. Um, and we did go ahead and provide our required letter to the state agency um, acknowledging that we do have some um, state required changes that uh, we'll be doing this year. So, so that's the status of, of that um, agenda item from February. Did they respond back? The state, all they do is they acknowledge that um, they received our letter and that we have one year to go ahead and pursue those amendments. Are we putting a schedule together to uh, to meet to review each one of those sections? Or? So last week we did go ahead and have an internal discussion regarding our path forward. So we do have additional discussions to take place internally, and then we'll go ahead and kind of map that out with a project timeline um, once we figure out some things. Anybody else? Again, thanks. You're welcome. And then there's one more item <laughs> for me. That's on there. Um, at your last meeting, there was a request to go ahead and p provide a tentative schedule. So some planning could happen on your end to make sure that we have some attendance at our meetings. So I went ahead and did that. And um, again, it's we're still going to say it's a draft agenda. So our, our thought process is at least a month ahead of time, the clerk's office will go ahead and contact the board members to make sure that um, we have a quorum if there are agenda items that are needing to come forward. Uh, we do have uh, two agenda items for your May LPA meeting. So that, is, that date is on the agenda. For are we the, sticking with the, the third Thursday of the month? We try our best, but depending where the month starts, the third Thursday might be a little off. So in that packet, or in, in your packet, there is a list of dates. So sometimes they fall on the third Thursday, sometimes they don't. It just kind of depends on um, where we fall in the calendar. Any date that we can pick that would work for both, so it's the same date? Yeah, so, some of our p people travel and do all kinds of stuff. So we're, we're trying to, and I know this is tough for you, John. I, I know it is. is. Is there any way to narrow down a date so when they make their schedules, they can sit, because they don't want to miss. So 
we try to keep it as consistent as we can just for that purpose because it's easy to get into a rhythm and know when you're, you're going to expect a meeting. The only time we look for flexibility is if there is a problem because a project needs certain timing or something needs to be adjusted by like a day or two or whatever we need to do to make, make dates work so that they can maybe get to a different city council meeting. In those cases, we may uh, shift a little bit. But on the normal circumstance, if you're going to see amendments like this come forward, we do our best to keep it on that third Thursday. Okay. That way you don't have to worry about us constantly changing the dates. Okay. And in May and that, June, that do you have that firm date? If I may. Um, so there is a draft schedule in your packet. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. So that calendar, in most cases, falls on the third Thursday. However, there. so for example, in June, the third Thursday is on the week before we have the um, second city council meeting of the month. So we try to do it the third Thursday of the month or the Thursday after the second city council meeting. So again, you're gonna have some months because of where it starts. So for example, June starts, June 1st is on Thursday. <laughs> so, um, so that meeting's pushed to the fourth Thursday. Um, so again, we tried our best keep the third Thursday, but there's some instances because of where the month starts where it may not fall on that third Thursday. And, and two, we may not have agenda items scheduled for that week. We just won't know until we get closer to those dates. But I did at least, we, we went ahead and provided this calendar. We vetted it with the city attorney, um, communications and the chambers to make sure it was available. So this is a starting point for us to have for the rest of the year. If we don't have agenda items, could we all come and hang out in your office on that day? Sure. Right. <laughs> try, to ha try to have food. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, what are we looking at next here then? Uh, next meeting ten tentatively scheduled for May 18th, so we're all good with that. I need a motion for the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. So moved. Anybody second that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time and for coming out today. We welcome our new board member. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you. See you in May. Meeting adjourned.